Welcome back to God's Lawyer Podcast. In this episode, we're going to begin a series on Jesus and the Talmud. You're like, what is the Talmud? Why does it matter? Here's why it matters, because the Talmud is the most influential literary product in Rabbinic Judaism. You're like, I don't even know what Rabbinic Judaism. Hang on, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But let me start with this and say that if there is a book that's the most influential, it's a collection of books, the Talmud is a collection of writings, you have really two collections, you have uh, the, the collection known Known as the Babylonian collection and the Palestinian collection, not necessarily meaning the Palestinian people, uh, just kind of where they originate. But if you've got a collection of writings that are referring to Jesus kind of throughout, uh, sporadic references, but you bring them together in Peter Schaeffer's work, Jesus and the Talmud, and the, in the collection, the works brought together, all these references brought together, and they basically say that Jesus did not rise from the dead, but Jesus is in hell, and his followers, the church, which claim to be the new Israel, are nothing but fools misled by a cunning deceiver. As a Christian, you would want to know what those writings say. There's not a time zone in which he's not being praised. Listen to me, there is not a moment since the resurrection of Jesus where there's not someone somewhere declaring that Jesus saved. Well, who is Peter Schaefer? Peter Schaefer is the author of a book, Jesus in the Talmud. He's a professor of Judaic studies at Princeton University. Uh, in his book, Jesus in the Talmud, he makes a scholarly and compelling case that the Talmudic writings uh, reference this individual, uh, Jesus Pandera, sometimes referred to as Pantera, depending on the spelling, or this individual known as Ben Stada, by the way, uh, you know, Ben means son of, are references to Jesus, who he calls the founder of Christianity. Then he p points out that the Talmud offers a counter-narrative to the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John. Why especially the Gospel of John? Because it's in the Gospel of John that we find probably the most clear references to Jesus' divinity. Historically, Christians have believed that Jesus is uh, one person with two natures. These natures uh, are not, they don't overlap. Uh, someone said uh, erroneously recently uh, that Jesus was divinity wrapped in skin. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know where you're getting that from. The Bible does not portray him that way, and that is, let me say this, because some of you, look, if you're listening to this channel, uh, and if you're a snowflake, you're going to tone out anyway real quick. So let me just say that saying that Jesus was divinity wrapped in flesh is stupid. You say, why would you say it's stupid? Because there's a, there's there's levels of ignorance, okay? There's ignorance that that's just somebody's gotten misinformation, and because of that, they're misinformed. And then there's somebody who doesn't have any information at all, and they just they make they they say foolish things. And so, to me, categorically, that was where stupid falls. And and listen, if you're offended by me saying that, uh, you you weren't going to be watching much longer anyway. So, uh, the the Jewish Talmud ridicules Jesus' birth, this idea that Jesus was born from a virgin, it ridicules that idea, and argues that the claim that Jesus is the Messiah of the Son of God is a farce. And the Talmud offers essentially a counter-narrative to the Gospels. That's important, because if you're going to share the Gospel with somebody who uh, practices uh, Judaism and really knows what the Talmud teaches, you're going to need to know these things if you're going to actually be effective in sharing the gospel. What is the Talmud? As I've already mentioned, it's the most influential writing, literary product in rabbinic Judaism. There's a misconception, many evangelicals, because they've been influenced by the likes of, uh, of C.I. Schofield, that uh, the Jewish religion today is essentially the continuation of the Old Testament, and that Christianity is a break. Not saying that Schofield directly says that, but but his Zionism essentially leads to those sort of conclusions. And you say, well, are these comments anti-Semitic? Listen, if 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 you're the type of person that thinks that criticizing anything Jewish makes you anti-Semitic, again, you're going to want to turn this channel off because I, I think you fall into the category, uh, probably also of of being stupid. Uh, you say, man, you keep saying that. I'm so uncomfortable with that. Again, you probably already tuned out anyway. So if, if you think that here in the United States of America that someone engaging uh, information that's widely known and offering a counter-narrative to it is somehow hate speech or anti-Semitic, then that, that does put you in a category of the fool. Uh, no, we're going to have an open conversation about this. So the continuation from the Old Testament 
beyond the Old Testament. The continuation is found in Orthodox Christianity. I don't mean Orthodox in the sense of Eastern Church, but in historical Christianity. Uh, you find the continuation of the Old Testament in historical Christianity. Modern-day Judaism, Rabbinic Judaism, is a break from the Old Testament religion. So that that's a you, you get you get these evangelicals who think basically that uh, modern Judaism is is just you know a hair's breadth away from the Old Testament religion, and all you got to do is read Isaiah fifty three, and people are like, oh, I believe. Okay, again, so modern Judaism you find really kind of four main categories there. You've got the Orthodox. Uh, this is the group that the written oral law and the and the Talmud are all authoritative. The written oral law are our special revelation, uh, divine revelation from God. You've got the Hasidic uh, Jews, the pious ones. You've got the ultra-Orthodox ultra Jews. This is in your Orthodox groups some subgroups. You've got the conservative Jews, not necessarily Zionist by and large. Some of them are, but kind of believe Judaism is evolving. They, they kind of take a middle-of-the-road position on revelation. It's both divine and human. You have what's known as Reformed Judaism. That's not the same as Reformed in the thing when you think of for Reformed Christianity, like Presbyterians or Reformed Baptists. Uh, this is more what you would consider probably more of a liberal approach to the religion and kind of reject special revelation. Then there's this a, a group, a minority group called the Reconstructionist. Uh, this group appears to believe that the Jewish people were not elect or you know necessarily chosen by God. So it's just as a quick overview. I don't mean to give try to give an in depth view of any of those, but the the Talmud comes to us. We got two main uh, versions. You have the Palestinian and Babylonian Talmuds, and they they're edited in the fifth to seventh centuries. But they come from source material probably much earlier, probably the third century. Uh, you know, maybe a little earlier, depending. We've got some cross reference material and other writings that would would lead me to believe that this this material is probably based on uh, counter-narratives to the Gospels being put forward by, uh, you know, by Jewish rabbis who are trying to provide, if you will, a defense of Judaism in a, in a counter-narrative, a polemic against Christianity. We see some of those polemics even in the Gospels. Uh, in John chapter 8, there's a reference uh, that they say, well, they're, you know, they're not... They're not uh, Sons of idolatry. Some have, have wondered, is that a reference early on to some of these polemical components about Jesus? Uh, there's also the polemic, well, you know, they say that dis the disciples stole the body. We find that in the Gospels as well. Uh, so this is basically, the Talmud as a whole is basically the rabbinic interpretation of the uh, Jewish law. But w I think it's very significant. It's a very significant collection, and certainly significant in the eyes of rabbinic Judaism, but significant in understanding kind of the evolution or uh, how Judaism really comes out of the first century and then on into its modern expressions. So, what is it? What is it that would even cause me to have this conversation? I mean, you know, all, remember, all we got to do is read Isaiah fifty-three, and you know, you go on a pilgrimage to to Jerusalem and. And uh, I'm sure every every Jew you, that you meet there, just read Isaiah 53 to them, uh, evangelical, and uh, watch, you know, because they'll, they'll all be converted if you just read that to them, because they're basically all just practicing Old Testament religion, and they just need you to come and read that chapter to them. You see, I mean, how naive we are sometimes. We, we don't even know what modern-day rabbinic Judaism teaches. We, we've been spoon-fed garbage in Sunday school with, with garbage Sunday school material, a small group material, uh, from those themselves aren't informed for so long that the assumptions we're making about rabbinic Judaism are so far afield that we don't even know how to effectively evangelize or share the good news with our Jewish friends and co-workers. So here's a couple things I want you to understand right away, right away coming out the gate. Five things that the Jewish Talmud teaches about Jesus in its counter-narrative. Five things the Jewish Talmud teaches about Jesus. I'm going to give you a quick breakdown of these, and then I'm going to unpack them in successive episodes. Five things the Jewish Talmud teaches about Jesus that you need to know. Number one, claiming that Jesus was not born of a virgin. Number two, claiming that Jesus was a rebellious student who entertained lewd sexual thoughts. 
Number three, that Jesus used magical powers to heal. Number four, that Jesus was not crucified, but actually stoned to death and then later hung on a tree. And number five, that Jesus is in hell with Titus and Balaam, claiming that Jesus is sitting in boiling excrement, boiling uh, feces um, for, for eternity. Wow. Now you know why we need to talk about this. This isn't just simply walking up to somebody, reading Isaiah 53, or saying, uh, pray this prayer, okay? Really, it was never walking up to people saying, pray this prayer. That's, that's not the gospel. That's not how we convert the nations. The Jewish Talmud is a proud, self-confident counter-narrative to the Christian message. It's not this passive, kind of ecumenical, uh, we're all going to get along. Uh, it doesn't present this, this uh, Judeo... Uh, Christian worldview. There's, there's really no such thing as Judeo-Christian worldview. That's That word gets thrown around, and I listen to people say it, and I usually, most people who say it have no idea what they're talking about. Look, there's, there's a Christian worldview, and then there is a Judeo worldview. Now, are there some similarities? Well, of course there are going to be some similarities, but are there massive differences? Absolutely. So, uh, this idea of claiming that uh, the United States is found on Judeo-Christian values uh, is a demonstration that we've adopted a secular, atheistic uh, sociology of religion. It's, it's a Christian worldview. In fact, you can go back and look at the founding documents of the 13 nations that united and made one nation. To people are like, well, they were states. That's just a synonym for nation. Those states understood themselves as being independent sovereigns. And if you read their founding documents, there's nothing there that would cause me to use the term Judeo-Christian anything. It was clearly, overtly Christian and testifying openly to being Christian. This nation was not founded on Judeo-Christian principles. This nation was founded on Christian principles. There is a difference. So here's the thing. Let's unpack these. these. I'm going to unpack them in great detail, but I want to kind of hit on each of these and why this is important. The Talmud isn't shy about its portrayal of Jesus. Now, neither is the Quran, neither is Mormonism. So why is it that evangelical Christians have been trained to, let me just be frank, okay? Evangelical Christians have been trained to hate Muslims, by and large, to despise them, and to love all things Jewish. Now, I can tell you this. Don't hate either group, and have had the opportunity to share the gospel with both Jews and Muslims. I've shared the gospel with more Muslims than with Jews. Uh, why? Because I just was around more Muslims uh, for a significant part of my life. So I had that opportunity more than I did sharing the gospel with Jews. I have shared the gospel with a number of, of Jewish people before. Uh, in fact, uh, is you, you could probably tell, I wear the long sleeves in these episodes, but I do have some tattoos. This is not an endorsement of tattoos. This episode is not about tattoos. But I do have some Hebrew script on my arm, and that will create conversations and give me an opportunity to have conversations not with just Jews, but with basically anybody who wants to know what it says. Uh, but I have had an opportunity to share the gospel with some Jewish people because of that being, being there. Uh, it's a reference from Psalm chapter 2, uh, where basically it says, Kiss the Son. Uh, or, you know, pay homage to the Son. Why? Because the Son would receive the nations as his inheritance. So let's go back to the Talmud. So the Talmud is proud of the position it takes. It doesn't take a position to present the historical Jesus. It's presenting this exaggerated fool and attacks every aspect, every element. You'll see this in successive episodes where basically it attacks every aspect of Jesus' life, origins, ministry, everything. Now, Here's the thing. When we want to, when we want to, want to take an honest look at something, we're going to have to be able to be critical. So the, the Talmud's the most influential writing in rabbinic Judaism. In fact, when we first set out, I recorded these episodes, I don't know how long ago it was, when we first started this podcast, myself and the producer were trying to kind of figure out how to do things, do it, just do it, do, do it well. And we scrapped those episodes because you know, we were still learning. And, you know, we're learning how to operate cameras, do sound. 
And so this this is actually, I think, like the third time I've tried to record this episode, and I hope I've got it right this time. And the first time was a long time ago we recorded. Now, I, then I recorded the second time with no sound. So here we go, a third a third chance at this thing. So back to what I, my point was this. If we're going to take an honest look at this, we've got to be able to be critical of the material. Because the Talmud is openly critical of Jesus. So let's just be honest about it. In this counter-narrative, the Talmudic writers accept responsibility for Jesus' death and argue that there's no reason to feel shame over Jesus' death because he was rightly executed as a blasphemer and idolater. If that doesn't get your attention as a Christian, I'm not sure what will. They contend that Jesus deserved death. They argue that Jesus is in hell and make it clear that the same fate awaits his followers as well because they believe in an imposter. They argue that there is no resurrection for him or for his followers. Claiming that Jesus was not born of a virgin, but claiming instead he was born out of wedlock, the son of a whore and her lover. You see that reference on Schaefer, page 10. Schaefer does faithfully point out and accurately point out, while the Talmud does not have a chapter per se on Jesus, these writings throughout, these references to Jesus ben Pantera or ben Stada are references ultimately to Christ. He points out there's, a, there's another individual, Eleazar, who basically becomes a doppelganger of Jesus. Uh, that is a, a representative, we think like of a twin or one that stands in for uh, claiming that Jesus was a rebellious student who entertained lewd sexual thoughts and when rebuked by his rabbi became an apostate and established a new cult? Is that what Christianity is? It's just a cult? We'll get into I'm gonna, each one of these claims I'm going to unpack in successive episodes. Uh, that, that Jesus used magical powers to heal. He went to Egypt to get those powers. Remember, we know Jesus went to Egypt and they the flight to Egypt, but why would they have him getting magical powers there? Well, you can remember obviously in the Old Testament, that who's providing, if you will, uh, also who provides like counterfeit miracles? Well, the, the priests who are uh, competitors or opponents of Moses are the ones. So it, it makes sense to me why they would portray him as going to Egypt to get magical powers, because that's, if you will, in the biblical narrative, the last time we find individuals who are able to provide, uh, if you will, counterfeits to the real thing. Fourth, that, that Jesus was not crucified but actually stoned to death. This goes against what we know, not only from the New Testament, but what we know of Roman law and the way Roman law would have been um, employed. Again, future episode, you'll be able to get more information on that. Five, that Jesus is in hell with Titus. Titus is the Roman general who uh, overthrew and destroyed, burned uh, Jerusalem in AD 70, and Balaam who led Israel into idolatry and sexual promiscuity. Uh, they claim that Jesus was convicted of sorcery. He was essentially a sorcerer. Of course, the Romans execute him as an insurrectionist. That's going to be important when I get into that uh, in a few episodes on the, the death of Jesus. They claim that they sought witnesses to come to his defense at trial, but none came forward. Again, going to reference, we're going to do a little more in-depth study on that. I'm trying to entice you to continue to watch these next episodes where they claim that for 40 days they sent out a herald. No one came to Jesus' defense. There was no one to back him up. He was basically left there for himself. Uh, it's interesting that he allegedly has this huge following as a sorcerer, right? Think about think about this, this counter-narrative, right? So it's this idea that Jesus has, he's casting basically spells on people, and he's convincing them of these things that aren't true. But then when, when, he's, when he's, I guess, arrested for it, allegedly for this, this sorcery, uh, all these people, I guess, who were under his spells are, are suddenly freed from it. None, none come to his defense. Look, the, the Talmud does not um, purport to present actual history. It's a polemic. It's an it's a, it's exaggeration in so many respects. Uh, it's not just an attack, but it's exaggerated attacks on the gospel, on Jesus, on Christianity. Why? Because, listen, there was a, it's a war of worldviews going on. So this wasn't the time when all these, these ecumenical, um, uh, you know, uh, pseudo-theologians uh, are, are running around going Judeo-Christian. Uh, they were in absolute conflict with each other. These two worlds were complete conflict. I, I think they still are in conflict with each other uh, in, in so many respects. But 
there is this conflict going on, and part of that conflict is kind of a back and forth uh, on this on this key central point. They weren't just a group of mono two groups of monotheists splitting hairs. They, they were these differences were you know significant. These were seismic differences. And so when you read the the the, the Talmud and you see these references scattered throughout, and thankfully Schaefer brings them together and compiles them for us, so that you can you can kind of get a big picture here of the overall view of Jesus in the Talmud. When you when you encounter that, you shouldn't be surprised that the the visceral nature of what's coming at Jesus. Look, it is fair to say, it is absolutely fair to say that the Timidic authors absolutely hate Jesus and Christianity. You can say that. Now, I'm not saying that Jews hate Christians, and I'm certainly not saying that Christians should hate Jews. That's, I'm saying none of that. Absolutely none of that, nor would I endorse that anytime, any way. But having an honest conversation about what, what a, a religious document says is not hatred. Okay? It's just exercising rights uh, that we are afforded and blessed with in this nation, uh, freedom of speech, which includes the opportunity to be critical. Being critical is not hate speech. Uh, claiming that being critical is hate speech demonstrates that you are using speech that, that is a speech that is um, part and parcel to the fool. So what's off limits? Nothing's off limits. Let's talk about it all. So here's what you have. The bottom line, at the end of the day, is you have countless, countless, countless Christians who have no idea what the Talmud actually teaches about Jesus. Uh, instead, they've been drinking up the Kool-Aid uh, that to be a Christian means that you are a Zionist. Uh, while I'm not a Zionist, I'm certainly not anti-Israel. Uh, in many respects, I've been very pro-Israel. I've been on the record being very pro-Israel on a number of things. Uh, but that doesn't mean that as a Christian I should be signing off that the nation of Israel are the people of God. Listen, the people of God are those who believe the gospel and who are following Jesus Christ. As a Christian, I believe that. Why? Historically, that's what Christians have believed. That's what the Bible teaches. Anyone who rejects Jesus Christ as the Messiah is not part of the people of God. I don't care what name you gave your nation state, that doesn't change anything. Uh, listen, the bottom line is is that the only way to the Father is through the Son. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but by me. I understand there's been a number of heretical books come out over the years. John Hagee put one out over uh, not too long ago, basically, that's saying that uh, the Jews don't have to believe in Jesus to go to heaven, this sort of thing. Absolutely obnoxious stuff. You have the hyper-dispensationalists who basically say there's two Gospels. There's the Gospel of the Kingdom and the Gospel of Grace. Uh, in that, that there's uh, books in the New Testament are just for Jews and some just for Christians. You have all sorts of this ignorance that is Christians have been bombarded with, but thankfully now we've got a younger generation growing up recognizing that we have access to information. We can go get that information. We can learn from it, and learning from it, we're faithfully exegeting culture, and as we exegete culture and we faithfully exegete Scripture, we're going to be able to be effective by and used by our Lord in converting the nations to Christ our King. Well, until the nations are converted, there can be no excuses, no retreat, no surrender. Why? Because Jesus Christ is king, even if the Talmud doesn't believe it. <laughs>